So again, thank you all for being here today and taking the time. Uh, this presentation uh, is probably gonna run, uh, I don't know if we'll get through all of it, um, you know, via the outline, it, it was pretty robust uh, as far as what we were trying to put in here. So there's a lot of different pests that we'll just take a quick look at. Um, but before we get started, one thing that FMC uh, always does is um, we do a, uh, a safety share. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, advance the slide here if I can. For some reason we're not advancing today. We're going to try this one more time. I'm going to stop sharing and, and start it again. Yeah, there you go. Is on full screen? Not yet. yet. Yeah, it's not pulling up the full screen for me for some reason. I think worst case, you can you can you can work on that. Maybe try it on a break. Oh, there you go. There we go. There we go. I got it now. I think. All right. So, all right, so we'll start over. Uh, so back to uh, pest identification. I apologize for that little delay. Uh, technology is always fun to work with. Um, but one of the first things we do at uh, FMC is always include a safety share uh, in really all of our presentations. So um, this is something that doesn't necessarily have to be pest control related. Um, it's just something that maybe just uh, stays in your mind about something you can do from a, from a safety standpoint. So. This one I thought was kind of appropriate. You know, August is National uh, Immunization Awareness Month, and you know, uh, you know, COVID aside, uh, there are some immunizations that we should all uh, be aware of. And um, one thing at CDC um, on their website, they do have something called an adult vaccine quiz. So as we get older, you know, I, I know myself uh, included. I'm not sure what vaccines I should have or maybe have updated. Uh, it's been, gosh, many years since I've, I've had a uh, immunization uh, or a vaccine, uh, you know, again, COVID notwithstanding. Um, so what they actually have on their website is an adult vaccine quiz. It's a quick, you know, maybe 10 question type quiz, you know, things like your age, you know, um, if you're going to be traveling in the future, in near future. Uh, and what it does is it then gives you a list of vaccines that maybe are recommended for you. Uh, the other neat thing is you hit another quick button and it puts it into a form that you can take and share with your, your doctor um, who really should make that ultimate decision along with you. So again, it, it makes it very easy to figure out maybe what you should have, uh, you know, as you, you know, get a little bit older, you're outside of school, you're not really getting so many vaccines. Um, one other neat thing uh, uh, with the site here. So it talked about, you know, with COVID-19, um, you know, ordering for vaccines through CDC, uh, they tracked this data, dropped about 14% from 20 to 2021. 20, and then um, from 2019, the measles vaccine ordering is down by more than 20%. They, they attribute this to kids not being in school. So they didn't have to go in person. So um, maybe they missed some of these. So again, just uh, something to be aware of, you know, try to make sure you're up to date on vaccines. And I'm going to share. Uh, this is my result from when I did the quiz. So it talked about things like me measles, hepatitis A and B, influenza, uh, meningitis, and then uh, tetanus uh, boosters. I was doing some traveling overseas, so I probably should have done this before I left. Um, but what it also does, again, creates this form. You can put in your name, uh, print this out, take it to your doctor, and then he can look at the ones that are recommended and uh, and go from there. So anyway, uh, just something to keep in mind as, as we're... Uh, at least as I got a little bit older as an adult, I had no idea what vaccines I needed or, or uh, needed boosters on. So, so that's it. 
Uh, so now we'll jump in um, to pest identification. Uh, again, I've got a lot of slides here. We're probably not get, going to get through all of them. So I think I'll get to, you know, uh, the hour and then uh, go ahead and uh, probably stop there wherever we are and uh, we'll take some questions and, and other things. So, um, so insects, right? So if you look at an insect, you know, a lot of folks say, well, what is it? You know, what makes it an insect? Uh, and really it's the three body segments. Uh, they do have uh, typically winged adults. You know, there are some uh, exceptions to that as, as there always are. In, in science and nature, uh, six legs, and they do have antenna. Look at some other uh, non-insect arthropods. So we'll look at a few of those as well. Uh, differing numbers of body segments. So a lot of them only have two segments instead of three, like your true insects do. Uh, they also usually have a few more legs, so you know eight or more. Uh, and then also, um, typically they don't have wings. So this is your non-insect arthropods. So. You know, these are all considerations for helping identifying, you know, what you're dealing with. It's always, um, I get a lot of questions, you know, how do I treat for this bug? Somebody sends me a picture uh, and usually it's a family member or a friend and it's like squished. I can't even see it, you know, can't tell if it's an insect or something else. Um, so these are things that you really need to look at um, uh, to help you, you know, diagnose what you're, what you're dealing with. Um, you know, what's the big deal, right? So I went back uh, again, it's been probably at least 10 to 15 years since I did any kind of classwork on, on insects and, and, uh, and schooling. Um, you know, this guide, the Smithsonian Handbook on Insects is really good. Uh, gets real IDs down to um, you know, family level, which is pretty neat. Um, but what they have in here is a quick chart. This is looking at really all, all, of, the, all of the species on earth. And if you look at insects, you know, they're, about 56% of all species. Uh, that includes your plants, your fungi, your bacteria, your invertebrates. Um, but if you look at some of the non-insect arthropods as well, it puts it up to about 73%, I think, of, of really all the, um, the life you know, on this planet. So pretty big deal. Uh, the good news is probably less than 1% of these are pests. So uh, we don't have to know all of them, thank goodness, but kind of puts it in a little bit of perspective. Another quick screenshot from uh, from the Smithsonian uh, handbook here um, shows you kind of how you know insects are classified. They, they fall under, of course, the animal kingdom, um, but then as you go down, you know you get more specific to the Arthropoda, to Mandibulata, Hexapods, um, and insects are under this uh, Hexapod uh, group. Uh, but there's a lot of other things uh, that are very similar here as well. If you move across. We look at the crustaceans, so there are some of those that we deal with. Um, looking at things like the Miripoda, uh, these are things like your centipedes, millipedes, and then over here um, are your, your spiders um, and, and ticks and things like that. So um, insects, uh, this is interesting here. There are 29 orders according to this book. Now, again, I told you this was probably from my time in, 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 in the classroom. Um, that number changes, uh, I believe it's at 28 now. Uh, termites have kind of lost their status as their own order. Uh, they were put under the uh, the cockroaches. Um, you also have over a million species here, a lot of families as well, uh, almost a thousand. If you look across, you know the other um, arthropods, uh, by far majority are are the insects. So, uh, just to give you another perspective on on numbers. So 28 orders today, uh, they, this number can change periodically. As I talked about, termites are now an infra order um, within the uh, Blatidias or the cockroaches. Uh, down the right-hand side here, there's a list of really what these orders are. Uh, so there's a lot of them here, uh, you know, for our sake today. Uh, I'm gonna look at, you know, a, a few of these. So the cockroaches, beetles, flies, uh, maybe some of the true bugs, some ants, spiders, ticks, and then maybe, uh, uh, get down to looking at some of the uh, some of the pill bugs and and, uh, and what they look like, some of their uh, identifying characteristics. So we're going to start out actually with a with a non insect arthropod group, the spiders. Uh, these guys have the two body regions, so a head and cephalothorax, uh, um, no antenna, uh, two, four, or six eyes, but most have eight. So this was interesting. I, I do have a whole presentation on spiders that I do, and just looking at the variation in the number of eyes, you know, th these are things that can help you identify them. 
Uh, they usually have a, one pair of palps for manipulating food, uh, anchylocera or, or fangs or biting mouth parts. Uh, four pairs of legs, uh, they do spin silk. Um, males are generally you know, smaller than females. And you know, with that uh, silk production, some build very elaborate webs, others are more your ambush type uh, spiders. So we'll see, I think a couple of, uh, of each. Uh, so looking at a spider, you know, it, again, in my mind, it doesn't look like an insect because it's not, but you do have those two body parts, the cephalothorax and the abdomen. Um, this will not be on the quiz, so, so don't worry. You don't have to you know, name all these different body parts, but just gives you the basic structure of, of, of a spider. And then uh, we'll look at, look at an insect a little bit later on, how it differs. So a couple of these I'm gonna look at, um, you know, brown recluse spiders, you know, I get a lot of questions on these. Uh, I am down in Florida these days, and it's amazing, you know, how many reports of, um, of brown recluse bites there are in Florida. Um, you know, typically not the range of brown recluse. So, you know, it's not something that we should see here, but years ago, I saw some data where um, Florida had the most reported brown recluse bites of, of any state, uh, which to me means it's being misdiagnosed. But the best way to tell if you run into those situations, the customer says I was bit by a brown recluse, well, where's the spider? Um, you can't tell by looking at them, you know, we're not medical doctors, we don't know what their conditions are. Um, so without the spider, it's, it's hard to tell, but uh, brown recluse has this, uh, you know, upside down uh, or, or fiddle shaped uh, uh, marking on its uh, cephalothorax. Um, it also has three pairs of eyes. So this is a six eyed spider. Um, and those two things can be pretty diagnostic to them. Um, Another thing I wanted to show was really the, the egg case here. Uh, this is how their eggs are laid. So again, I wouldn't say 100% diagnostic, but it is something that can help you identify if, if there are brown recluse uh, that you're dealing with in a structure. Um, so we talked about the six uh, eyes and the and brown uh, or dark violin markings. These guys are mainly nocturnal, uh, so they're out at night. They're really kind of fragile spiders. Uh, you see a lot of them missing legs, uh, you know, and, and kind of um, disheveled shape, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, they do like the undisturbed type habitats, so outside under logs or stones, pretty sheltered areas, indoors, you know, any little cracks or crevices. Um, and usually we get bitten by them uh, if you happen to have one in your shoe, you put your foot in there, uh, or if they're, you know, under bedding or something, you lay on one or sit on one. Um, their venom is potentially dangerous to humans, uh, can cause necrotic bites uh, that really don't heal very well uh, and maybe take several months to heal. Um, you know, both males and females can bite, but I'll say they have to be of a certain size, so really a larger size, uh, you know, quarter size or bigger. Um, otherwise, they really just can't penetrate the skin. Um, and they're not out to bite you. No, that's not really what they want to do. Um, the common house spider is a really good predator of, of the brown recluse spider. So next one, uh, we'll look at some of the widow spiders. Um, you know, these, I think we all kind of know what they sort of look like, but if you look at some of the immature stages, uh, they do look a little bit differently. Uh, they're typically a shiny spider. Uh, they kind of have a messy web uh, overall, um, but they do usually have as adults a, a, a distinct uh, red marking, you know, on their, on their abdomen. Um, and, you know, again, their webs, you know, not very neat. They don't look like a big orb weaver web. They're usually pretty messy. Um, and in sort of out of the way areas, my, my sister actually in New Jersey sent me a picture of one that she found in a hose reel. So you open up that lid, you reel out your hose uh, to treat, you know, water your lawn. She found one actually in there. I know uh, bait boxes in some areas, so rodent bait boxes, these guys love to get into. Um, but again, Pretty, uh, pretty easy to identify with some of those red markings that they have on them and that shiny black appearance uh, as well. Um, we do have a, a large number of species in North America. Um, black widow spider does have a very potent toxin or venom. I just consider one of the, if not the most venomous spider in North America, definitely one of the most venomous. Um, very small amounts of venom though uh, are injected. Um, and you know they're not something where if if you're bitten by one uh, you're gonna it's like instant death so uh, really pretty rare uh, people with some kind of a, a compromised immune system you know can maybe have a, a more uh, severe reaction um, 
males and juvenile uh, females are not strong enough to penetrate human skin, their fangs. So again, they do possess venom, but typically they're not gonna be able to bite through your skin. Um, really only the adult uh, females are. Uh, we talked about the, the hourglass markings. So they can be yellow to orange to red. They may not even be in hourglass. So don't be tricked and say, oh, it's the red dot. So it's not one. Um, you know, they can, they can definitely lay uh, egg sacs with anywhere from 25 to 250 eggs. Um, it takes about two to four molts uh, to uh, reach adulthood. Um, kind of a smaller web, about a foot in diameter. We talked about it's kind of messy looking, but that's what they use to catch their prey. It's also very, very strong. Um, interesting fact about, you know, Black Widow silk, uh, they actually used it on bomb sites in World War II bombers because it wouldn't uh, bend or um, uh, distort under um, the pressures of flying. So uh, kept straight, you know, sights, crosshairs on their sights so they could actually do their job. So pretty interesting uh, fact about them. Um, so the bites, uh, you know, this one, it's not necessarily the, the site of the bite where you get a lot of pain. It's more severe cramping in the abdominal muscles in the back and usually diminish after a couple of days. Um, and, you know, if, if people think they're being bit by these, always good to, again, find a specimen on the property that they can then take, uh, you know, to their medical you know, professional if they, they need, need any kind of treatment. Um, because then you have a pretty, uh, you're pretty sure that they were actually bit by this spider and it's not something else. Um, so looking at uh, the brown widow, uh, this is another species that's uh, come up more and more. Um, you know, they, they kind of have a highly variable pattern on the females. Uh, they can be white, gray, light brown, dark brown, or almost black. Um, up in the upper right here, uh, we do show some of the egg casings. And, you know, this is pretty indicative of, of the widow spiders. They have these spiky egg casings. So sometimes you may not see the spider, but at least you maybe can find these and, and know that they're, they're around. So it's not just looking at the actual spider, but looking at the egg casing that can help you identify this one. Uh, these guys are pretty much in the, in the southeast, uh, out to the Midwest, so out to Texas, California, possibly Arizona. Um, again, red markings, you know, on the abdomen. Again, I wouldn't say it's an hourglass, uh, and it can be red, orange, or yellow. And then the egg sacs with these uh, spiked uh, surface. Um, wolf spiders. Uh, this is one that I, I, I really like. Um, you know, I, they're pretty much throughout the United States and, and they're varying in size. Colors are pretty similar though. They're basically a brown to black. They may have some longitudinal stripes on them. Uh, they can be anywhere from a half an inch up to, you know, with the legs spread out, you know, three inches in diameter. I've had people tell me, you know, they're the size of a dinner plate, you know, when they see them, I think they, they overreact, but I've seen them, you know, I'd say maybe even in the four inch range you know, with the legs out. So they're, they're big, they're scary, uh, they're hairy spiders uh, that people don't like in their homes. And, you know, for, for the most part, you know, these really, I would say, are not really that dangerous to people. Um, they just kind of freak out when they see them. Uh, these guys do kill a lot of other insects and arthropods around the home, um, but they can bite you when they get that larger size. So they can actually, you know, penetrate the skin with their mouth parts. And um, a couple of things that are diagnostic on, on these guys, um, the females will carry around their egg sac. Uh, so if you see these out in the mulch um, and they're carrying kind of a white uh, you know, ball on them, they actually carry around the egg sac. They don't just lay it and leave it somewhere. So that can help diagnose uh, a wolf spider. Um, and then um, their eyes actually reflect light, which is pretty cool. They do have eight eyes. Um, that are more uh, vertical uh, on the front of the cephalothorax than some of the others. Um, again, if you go out at night, shine a flashlight into mulch around your house, you'll probably see some little reflections and uh, that's from these guys. So um, as far as applications for these, again, if they're not getting indoors, uh, if they're not a problem, you really don't need to treat for them. Um, but uh, you can treat you know, outdoors uh, in the warmer months is when they're active. Uh, down in Florida, down here is probably year round that I see them. So there's really no pause uh, where like it is up north. All right, so that brings us to our first uh, keyword, which is um, which is JAWS. So type JAWS into the chat box. Uh, 
and if anyone's wondering, this is an ant I found, uh, had the privilege to visit the Amazon uh, recently, and this is one of the ants we found down there. Uh, the neat thing is in the middle here, there's a little trap, so if you irritate this middle part or get close to it, there's a fringe of hairs there that snaps those jaws shut around, uh, around a prey item. So we'll give you a few minutes to, uh, to type that in. Uh, again, type jaws into the, uh, into the chat feature. And you know, Brian, I will just uh, give a reminder to everyone, put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we've had a few questions, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, keep putting them in there throughout and we'll be answering them either throughout or after. All right. All right, so hopefully everybody, you know, was able to type that in um, uh, and we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll move along. So um, now I'm going to switch a little bit over to ticks. Um, these are uh, uh, arachnids, but they're all, but they're in the order of the Akari. We'll talk about a couple of different species. Uh, this is a pretty neat chart. Um, you know, it talks about or shows you some of the different species, gives you a good picture of them. Um, we're going to talk really just about some of the hard ticks, not really the soft ticks here. But this chart kind of gives you an idea of the size, uh, some of the hosts, some of the habitats, and then some of the uh, health implications uh, uh, from some of these ticks. So these guys, you know, can transmit disease um, and a lot of different types of diseases. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, so looking at the uh, American dog tick, um, the male and the female here, um, basic description here is, is brown with a white shield marking behind the head. That's kind of this piece over here. Um, you know, they're harbored, you know, wooded areas. They, they do like areas where obviously there's dogs present. Um, uh, they will get inside homes uh, and kennel areas. And these guys, you know, will, will stay inside a home as long as there's dogs there. Uh, they'll lay eggs inside, you know, if they, if they need to. Um, so this one can be pretty problematic inside a home. Uh, diet, you know, primarily the blood of, of dogs. Uh, but make no mistake, they will get on us as well. Um, Application timing, you know, throughout the warmer months, uh, outside uh, and then indoors, uh, really could be year round. And you know, when these guys lay eggs, I mean, it's it's a bunch of eggs. We're talking in the in the hundreds and hundreds of eggs they can lay. So, um, so there could be you know tons of these guys coming out, especially when they're when they're just indoors. Uh, moving on to the uh, Lone Star tick, uh, brown tick, you know, so it's not too. Uh, Similar to the dog tick, but does have this distinct white spot behind the head. Uh, uh, this is on the uh, on the female here. They do like wooded areas, you know, thick underbrush, um, areas where there's a lot of white-tailed deer, um, which is really the primary host of, of the mature ticks. Um, widely distributed eastern United States, but more common in the south. Uh, I grew up again up in the northeast. Uh, didn't see these guys much at all. Uh, saw more of the dog ticks and um, and the black-legged ticks or deer ticks. Uh, they do take uh, blood meals from white-tailed deer, humans, and other small mammals as they um, uh, as they mature in size. Uh, they move up in size on the coast. Uh, there are seasonal peaks um, uh, for these ticks uh, from April to June, and um, in May through July and August, uh, you'll see um, more of the nymphs, uh, whereas uh, the larva peak July through September. Uh, if they're indoors, you know, it could be year round depending on how they're getting inside. Uh, they are really a public health pest, so there's a lot of diseases. I'm not going to read these off because uh, there's a lot of big words there that I probably won't pronounce well. So, uh, but again, a lot of different diseases that they can uh, can transmit. And really, you know, looking at where they harbor um, is really where you would target treatments. And this is for really most of the tick species like taller grass areas, um, you know, wooded areas. Uh, a lot of them will get along the edge of pathways uh, or also that interface between, let's say, a, a lawn and a wooded area. Uh, because what they'll do is they'll climb up on some of that higher vegetation. As a deer or other mammal or you walk past, um, they'll cling on to you um, from climbing up maybe a foot or so onto that vegetation. So uh, that's how they really get onto us and uh, can become a problem. So, those are also the areas that you would want to, you know, maybe think about treating. Um, 
you know, treating the center of a yard for ticks, you know, really not not needed for the most part. It's usually too hot and too dry there. Um, they're not going to be, you know, laying eggs or developing, you know, where it's very hot, uh, very dry, and and, uh, and lower vegetation. They want that more shady, moist, um, you know, lower heat uh, type areas uh, like those edge areas. So looking at this distribution, so this is kind of just showing where, you know, Lone Star ticks mainly are. Really, again, over here in the eastern half of the U.S. and really concentrated more in the south. Um, females can deposit up to 5,000 eggs when they find a suitable, uh, I'll call it a microclimate, uh, so an area where, again, moisture is right, temperature is right, um, conditions are right for them. And uh, we talked about some of those peaks and, and when they're, they're really out and about. And most of the ticks, it's really going to be that summer season, spring throughout the summer. All right, so black-legged tick or, or deer tick, as I call it. Um, this one, um, you know, the females are kind of this blackish, uh, they have a sort of a blackish head um, with reddish to brown body. Uh, these guys are your Lyme disease vectors. Uh, they're very small uh, for the most part, you know, maybe the size of a poppy seed. So you can see maybe 0 0.2 inches, which again, is a very small uh, size. A tick. Uh, they like these areas of vegetation that we already talked about along edges and paths. Um, mostly uh, in the eastern U.S. and uh, some on the west coast as well. Um, they do feed on mice and deer and humans and um, the, the main uh, stage you want to target with this is, is the nymph stage and that's throughout the spring and summer. And then your adults are really fall and early spring. And the reason why the nymphs are important is that's the stage that transmits most uh, Lyme disease to uh, to humans. I think I have a couple of slides here too that show that. So looking at you know uh, Lyme disease and, and where it's found, you can see the Northeast is pretty big. Sorry, that switched on me. Upper Midwest. Each one of those dots represents a case. And this is a little bit dated slide. It's about gosh, 15 years old, these numbers have only gone up. So um, again, if you're in those areas, uh, uh, important tick to look out for. Life stages, uh, again, looking at the larval stage and the nymphs, the nymphs here are the main uh, stage that transmits to, uh, to man. So moving on to, uh, to insects. Um, you know, they do have three body parts. So they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And, you know, as what's different, you know, as opposed to some of the ticks and spiders we looked at, that only had two body parts. So real simple, one, two, three. A um, uh, couple interesting other things about the insects are, if you look at, you know, all the legs, um, they're all attached, even though there's six, they're all attached to the thorax. Uh, wings would also attach there on the uh, winged adults. So that's really the powerhouse of, of the uh, of the uh, of the insect. Uh, just thought that's kind of interesting to point out. You know, if you're seeing something with legs all along it, or uh, it could be an immature insect, or it could be something else. Um, but your insects, the legs are attached there. So we're going to look at some cockroaches. We're going to look at the uh, Latidia um, orders here. Uh, so first one we'll look at is the American cockroach. I know. Uh, if you're anywhere in the South, you, you know what an American cockroach is. Um, I think some folks also give it a little bit a nicer name called a palmetto bug. Um, but very large cockroach, um, one to two inches. Some of these guys can be a lot bigger. Uh, they are a pretty prolific uh, flyer. Um, they do have a reddish brown, uh, with a pale brown or yellow uh, band on the edge of the pronotum here. So and that's really talking about this area up here. Um, large cockroach, this type of uh, patternation, strong flyer, you know, it's, a, it's an American cockroach. Uh, they like to get, you know, into mulch beds, you know, wooded or grassy areas with high moisture, so moisture and food. Uh, indoors, they do get around, you know, behind cabinets, you know, basements, uh, near food and water. So that's where you're, really where you're going to find these guys. Southern U.S., uh, up the east and west coast with pockets in the central U.S. So they are Fairly prolific. Um, they do like to feed on a lot of different things, so dead insects, decaying organic matter, uh, almost anything. Um, I will say with American cockroaches, you know, <clears throat> they, 
they don't necessarily want to be inside. I think they come inside when there's opportunity. Uh, but they're happy to be outdoors, you know, in your, could be in your garage, you know, it's, it's maybe a little bit warmer out there, a little bit more humid, humid uh, in the summer months, um, a lot of moisture and a lot of other, you know, pests possibly getting into the garage they're going to feed on, but they will come indoors. Uh, you leave food out, you leave, uh, you know, if there's water sources for them, you know, they'll definitely come inside. Um, in the warmer months, you know, treatment possibly all year long, uh, and then indoors, you know, pretty much as needed uh, as well. Uh, there are some baits for these guys uh you know they're so large though it's sometimes you know you got to put out a lot of bait to, to get control and of course there's just things you can spray around the foundation as well um just looking at i just want to point out one quick thing here this is interesting you know if you're inspecting you know a home and you find you know droppings say under a cabinet or somewhere um, the american cockroach dropping does look similar to, to something um to a house mouse dropping uh, American cockroach dropping though has these little grooves on it uh, and it's more blunt than the uh, house mouse, which is more pointy on the ends um, and a little bit um, you know, more distorted shape, I guess. So, you know, if you see droppings, you might think they're mice, but it could also be these. Just an interesting point to, uh, to note. All right, so moving on to the uh, oriental cockroach. Um, so this one is dark brown to black. Uh, Outdoors, it likes warm, damp, shady areas, uh, areas containing natural debris. Uh, they will come indoors in cooler temps, um, but um, again, they do like um, moisture levels that are a little bit higher. Uh, basements, crawl spaces, you know, along the foundation, you know, under sidewalks. These are the ones too that, you know, if you see work in a city, sometimes uh, these could be running out of sewers if they're doing work on on the sewer systems. Um, you know, floor drains. Uh, you know, any damp uh, area uh, inside the home, an area they could get into. Uh, they're throughout the U.S. and they do feed on decaying plant and animal matter. Um, and timing of treatment, you know, outdoors throughout the warmer months, indoors could be year round. But they are public health pests, as, as are most uh, of the cockroaches uh, that can invade the house because of what they feed on, right? They're feeding on decaying material. Um, possibly walking then in across your counters uh, and maybe moving some pathogens along uh, with them. Um, one last thing on these guys, uh, you'll notice the wings are pretty stunted on these guys. So uh, females really can't fly at all. Uh, males uh, very weak, if, if at all. Um, so very, very short wings. They don't cover the, the full extent of the abdomen. It's just another way to, to help identify these guys. Um, let's see. So German cockroach, uh, these again, you know, anybody who does any kind of pest control, uh, any kind of commercial pest control for sure, uh, definitely uh, knows a German cockroach when they see them. Uh, color brown to dark brown, they're about a half inch in size, uh, and they will harbor just about anywhere they can inside. And, you know, this is places like, you know, under cabinets, wall voids. I've seen them, you know, behind picture frames on a wall. Uh, they do like to have, you know, really two surfaces of their body uh, or two parts of their body touching a surface. So something above and something below. Um, it's called thigmotaxic. So that, that's what they like to do. They like to have that comfort of, of being secure on both sides or on two sides. Um, these are throughout the U.S. These are an indoor uh, cockroach. Uh, these are the ones that, uh, you know, the nightmares in commercial kitchens or restaurants or sometimes in homes, you, you see just huge huge numbers of these um you know you can also uh when you walk into a place if you've done this long enough you can smell them you know when they're there um you know i've, I've been in some pretty bad places uh where the populations are just through the literally i mean everywhere possible that they could be uh, they're going to be hiding behind every crack and crevice behind picture frames mirrors you name it uh, but what makes them uh you know way to identify them these two uh, longitudinal stripes on the pronotum um, the wings also don't necessarily go past the tip of the abdomen, and we'll see why that's kind of important in the next one that we look at. Um, there's a lot of treatment options for these guys, uh, baiting indoors, uh, you know, in kitchens, areas like that. Uh, does work very well. There's a lot of baits out there for these guys. Uh, you can also use residual treatments, um, you know, uh, as well into wall voids and areas where these guys like to hang out. So cracks, crevices. Um, behind baseboards, anywhere they want to hang out. Um, 
The next one is an Asian cockroach. This is one that got a lot of a lot of talk in the news several years back. I haven't heard a whole lot recently, <clears throat> but the reason why is it looks very similar to the German cockroach. Um, it does have you know, these two stripes on on the pronotum, um, but some of the differences are that um, the wings do extend past the tip of the abdomen. And another way, just behaviorally, uh, these guys are very good flyers where the German cockroach just is not. You're not gonna see them flying around. Uh, they're gonna scurry and run. Uh, the Asian cockroach will fly to lights at night. Um, they do feed on some of the same things, decomposing waste, trash, you know, plant material, things like that. Um, and they're mainly an outdoor. They will come inside though, there, there's no doubt. Um, and these guys have been found throughout Florida really the Gulf Coast. Um, so if you see a flying German cockroach, it's probably this guy. Um, and here's a quick side by side, you know, which one is which. So again, very, very similar. Um, this one over here is the, uh, is the Asian cockroach. Um, again, a little bit more uh, dainty, I guess, uh, maybe not quite as robust as, as a German cockroach. Um, but very similar in look. And a lot of times you'll have to send it in, you know, to have it looked at by an expert, get it under a microscope, maybe look at some other characteristics as well to help you. Um, brown banded cockroach. So this one, you know, as the name entails, uh, it is brown with gold or tan markings. This is about a half an inch. Uh, these guys are, are, are an indoor cockroach as well. Uh, so they can be a, a, a nuisance inside. Um, you know, the males will fly when disturbed. Uh, the females really can't fly. You can see the difference here and really what the wings are like on these. But, you know, fairly fairly diagnosed, diagnostic from the, the striping pattern that you see on them. Um, again, another one that you could, you know, bait or possibly even treat for, uh, but they can become a nuisance indoors. Uh, all right, so now we're gonna, you know, uh, switch gears a little bit. We're gonna go to flies. So uh, this is uh, uh, the order of Diptera. And you know, I tried to put a few a few pests from from each of uh, the groups that we we noted in the beginning, uh, but there was a lot of other orders that we could we could pull from. So I uh, just wanted to pull some of these to, to give you a taste of different uh, different orders of insects. So uh, the house fly um, is the first one here. Um, it measures, you know, four to let's say eight millimeters long. Um, distinguished from other flies by these uh, four dark uh, longitudinal stripes up here on the thorax uh, with a yellowish abdomen. Uh, the males, their eyes almost touch, uh, so they're much more visual. Um, and what we mean by that is their, your eyes would basically cover almost the entire uh, top of the head or front of the head. Um, female does have a wider space between her eyes um, and the, uh, the head of the adult fly uh, has reddish eyes and these sponging mouth parts and we all kind of Maybe know what they're for, but usually not a not good to think about when you're out having a picnic. Um, they do have complete metamorphosis. You know, looking at some of the different life stages. You know, of course, they have a larval uh, life stage or a, a maggot life stage. Uh, they can complete their life cycle in seven to ten days of so very fast reproduction, ten to twelve generations per year, um, and uh, in temperate areas up to twenty plus uh, generations. And I don't know if you guys, hopefully you can see the number down here. Uh, I've got a menu bar in front of mine, but if you had a pair of flies beginning reproduction in April, um, they may be prog progenitors of under optimal conditions. It's about 191 followed by about 15 zeros. So I don't know if that's a quintillion or whatever that is, but it's a bunch of flies. And uh, again, very prolific uh, producers. Uh, so now we'll move on to the stable fly. So it resembles a house fly, uh, but is more robust and more aggressive. Uh, these guys also have a very irritating bite, and painful bite. Um, it does have uh, four distinct longitudinal stripes and several dark spots uh, on the abdomen. So again, similar, but you have this, I almost like to say it's almost like a checkerboard pattern on this guy. Uh, about the same size as a house fly though. Uh, and they do have very sharp, uh, uh, mouth parts and you know when these guys are biting you. Uh, they do like to uh, uh, reproduce um, in decaying uh, vegetation. Uh, they also do have the same um, 
you know, maggot life stage or larval life stage. And uh, that's about it on this one. So next one, uh, this is a flesh fly. Uh, generally have contrasting black and gray stripes on the thorax. And this is, uh, again, you look at it and you say, well, it's similar to the house fly. Yeah, it is. But it's um, three dark lines uh, versus four in the in the house fly. So again, a little bit different, uh, but you can also, if you catch one, have a sample, uh, you can, you can kind of diagnose it this way. Um, adults have sponging mouth parts, uh, which are used to absorb liquids. Again, similar to uh, to the house fly as well. Um, uh, they do have a, a prominent row of bristles on each side of the thorax, uh, just above the uh, base of the wing uh, and uh, base of the hind leg, in addition to another row uh, just under the base of the wing. Uh, they do have two sets of bristles uh, that differentiate them from musket flies. Uh, they rarely have uh, both. So, um, they most resemble uh, blowflies, but they don't have this metallic color. And I don't have blowflies in here, which are your typical uh, metallic uh, uh, looking flies. Um, you know, treatment for flies uh, can entail a bunch of things. You know, obviously residual spray treatment outside, indoors, things like lights. Um, uh, there are baits for flies, uh, something like our, our end zone uh, uh, sticker. Um, so again, uh, lots of different options here. Uh, they are attractive to light, uh, but you can also bait for them as well. So we're up to another keyword. So this keyword is lizard. So please uh, put that in the chat. And I don't know if we have any questions that came in that we want to answer at this time, but we can definitely do that. Hey, Brian, it's Tom. There is a, uh, there's a comment uh, okay. in here that says they've noticed a uh, field Asian cockroaches are slightly lighter than a German cockroach. Yep, yep. Yeah, I'd say that's true. Um, sometimes it's difficult when you don't have both, though. So if you don't have them side by side, it may be more difficult to say, wow, it's lighter or it's darker. Um, so yeah, but yeah, that's probably also, uh, that's very true. Yeah, I always like when uh, to identify something, we say, well, it's a little bit lighter or it's, uh, it's the wings are a little bit different than this one. Um, but a lot of times in the field, you don't have both. So it's hard to, um, to sometimes make that make that statement. Okay. I think that's got us up to date on the question so far. All right. So I think we've got maybe, what, about 10 more minutes? So I'm going to go ahead and, and move on. So again, put your keyword in. Um, That'll help you get your credit. So now we're gonna take a look at some of the ants. Um, you know, ants as a group, uh, these are these are under your Hymenoptera. So this is your ants, uh, wasps, bees, sawflies, you know, things like that. Um, you know, general shape of the ant. You know, we saw sort of a diagram in the beginning there uh, when we looked at just the, the body parts of an insect, but uh, some things that help you diagnose or, or identify, you know, which ant you're dealing with. Um, the number of nodes that it has. So is it two nodes or one node? Uh, and those would be right in here. Um, the antenna of the ant. So looking at number of segments uh, in the antenna can help be diagnostic in some cases. Uh, in this case, uh, on the acrobat ant, kind of the shape of the abdomen here. Uh, that's that's really your diagnostic uh, on the acrobat ant. Um, and these guys, and they can be shiny black uh, or, or red. Um, you know, they can have a, a red abdomen. Uh, they can have some other reddish coloration. So in, in some of these ant species, it's not only just the colors that you see here on, on the slides that I have, but they can vary a little bit. Uh, but acrobat ants, you know, about an eighth inch in size. Um, they nest outdoors in soil, leaves, you know, or wood. Indoors, they do get into to building voids. Uh, they'll actually get into styrofoam insulation um, and actually ex excavate some of that out, similar to what you know carpenter ants would do, um, but not usually in sound wood. These guys really, in my experience, haven't been shown to you know, cause structural damage in sound wood. Now, if it's damp or rotted, uh, yeah, they may be able to get in there, kick some of that out. I've seen them get under uh, loose mortar joints around chimneys, and they'll go in and they'll just pull out that mortar, uh, soft or, or degraded mortar, 
it's just sand. They'll just kick that out as well. Uh, so again, um, not something that does the initial damage, but they can definitely come in and, and probably make some things worse. Um, they do raise their abdomen when disturbed. So they'll get that abdomen up into the air. Um, but really that harder spade shape here is, is fairly diagnostic for, uh, for acrobat ants. Um, really located uh, you know, throughout the US, um, up in the Northeast, I think we had the ones that had a little bit of a reddish coloration to them as well. Um, but they do have two nodes uh, right in this area here. So again, uh, one thing I didn't talk about in the beginning, but if you're going to identify pests or, or try to, you know, be a little better at it. You know, something really good to get. You know, a good hand lens is always good. Um, I have a microscope that I bought that, gosh, I bought it 15 years ago. I think it was like $120. Uh, really good microscope. I use it to this day. I actually just used it a couple of days ago. Um, and with your smartphone these days, you can actually take a really good picture through the eyepiece of the microscope of something that you're really trying to highlight or, or look at under that scope. Um, you can then send that off to an expert, you know, if you're not comfortable identifying it, uh, send it off to your university folks um, and they could confirm, you know, maybe what you're seeing. Uh, I also did that recently with, um, I believe it was dry wood termites that were found on the, gosh, probably, I think it was like the 20th or 30th floor of a uh, apartment building in New York City. Pest control operator sent me the samples and really the wings are what helped identify. Then I took a picture under my microscope, sent it off to uh, University of Florida and they confirmed it. So, um, so get a good microscope. You know, it's also really good ones these days. You can actually, have, they have a USB port you can put right into your computer and pull the pictures up that way. So um, just a suggestion. Uh, and again, it helps you get better identifying some of these uh, pests. So looking at uh, the next one here, this is the Argentine ant. Uh, workers are all the same size, they're about an eighth of an inch. Um, it does emit uh, a musty odor when you crush it. So that's mm -hmm. something that can help you identify this one. Uh, large outdoor colonies, uh, these guys, um, I think if I remember correctly, they, they noted a colony that stretched from San Diego to San Francisco. Um, and typically it's not, it, it's a, more of a, a cooperative colony. So it's really not, in my mind, one colony started it. It's really a bunch of colonies getting together. Um, but very prolific ant. They do feed on um, honeydew and sweets. They also will take proteins. Um, and these guys are uh, basically, you know, Maryland, West Illinois, and then in your Southern states uh, out to the West Coast, uh, including California. We also have seen them, I believe here in Florida as well. Um, so they do have a kind of an uneven thorax. If you look in here, you can kind of see that. Um, they have a 12 segmented antenna with a club on the end. Um, and these guys produce LHs April through June. So depending on your geography, that may, may move a little bit. Um, but if you can knock down those uh, reproductives, uh, you may be able to uh, help get better control. Next one, uh, big headed ant. Uh, this one, you know, fairly easy to identify because they have these major uh, workers uh, with a very enlarged head. Um, you know, it's only about, you know, maybe 1% of the foragers that have this uh, this form. Uh, they're also there for protection. Um, and uh, again, fairly diagnostic when you when you find it. Um, the miners are about a 16th of an inch and these major workers can be up to a quarter inch in size. They do have distinct uh, piles of soil around their nests. Uh, so along sidewalks and lawns and flower beds. Um, they do prefer greasier, higher protein type foods and you know, they're found, you know, pretty much most of the Eastern US uh, and then somewhat out in the Southwest as well. 12 segmented antenna with the three segmented club and uh, certain spines on their on their uh, uh, thorax as well. So again, there are keys and ways to identify these, but you would need to put it under a microscope to really see some of those other characteristics. Um, Carpenter ant. So first off, I will apologize for my really sad carpenter ant photo. Um, I was scrambling to find something that I, you know, could use in here, and and um, you know, pulling just photos off the web, you know, sometimes it's not good because uh, there's certain you know uh, use limitations on them. So I pulled out an old sample I had in a box and took a took a photo of it. But carpenter ant, um, 
these are pretty large, you know, three eighths to a half an inch. Um, if you have reproductives, they could be definitely up to an inch long. Uh, so pretty robust ant. Usually a dark black or, or red and black combination. Have an evenly rounded thorax. Uh, they do have this one node uh, in between. At the end of the abdomen here, there is a, um, uh, a circle of hairs there. These guys, again, will kick out frass uh, from excavating wood, and they like that rotting or damp wood, foam insulation. Um, and usually when you see the, this uh, material that they kick out, it's kind of like sawdusty looking, and it will have a lot of dead ant parts in it as well. Uh, they'll kick dead ants out of the colony with the, with the trash. So you'll, you'll see that quite often. Uh, really found throughout the U.S. There's several species um, you know, throughout the U.S. Uh, they do like sweet sound proteins. Uh, we talked about the evenly rounded thorax and you know, up north, you know, spring throughout the summer into the fall uh, is when these guys are, are active. Um, and again, you can bait for them. You can also treat for them. Uh, they are active somewhat at night as well. So you can usually find trails going back to the main uh, main colony. The main colony is typically outdoors. Uh, they will have satellite colonies, sometimes indoors. Um, and you can just track them and see where they, they lead you back to and then treat the nest and hopefully uh, take care of the problem. Um, Tawny crazy ant, this is one that you know was known previously as a Caribbean crazy ant. I believe it was also identified in, in Texas and Houston area as the raspberry crazy ant. Um, this one is a Small ant, about an eighth inch in size, a single node, a very smooth, glossy body surface. Um, key with this one though, it, it will nest under just about anything outdoors. It'll get indoors as well, but extremely high numbers, uh, especially um, you know where there's no real natural enemies. And this is kind of along the Gulf Coast uh, in the Texas, they saw numbers in the billions per acre on this guy. They would get into electrical boxes, they would get into the lights at uh, Weave Hobby Airport. Um, and where, where these guys were found out there, and again, it was fairly new to have them there in that area, um, there was nothing else found. You know, you go into a neighborhood and all the other pests are gone. They just ate everything. Uh, even some of the birds, uh, they would get the nests and attack the chicks. Uh, they even kicked the fire ants out. So these guys were pretty prolific. And um, they do have a 12-segmented club uh, antenna with no club on the end. And... Um, Again, there's a lot of other identifying uh, characteristics. They say you know, the escape on the antenna, which is your first part in here, is twice as twice the width of the head. So that's always a fun measurement to do, but you definitely need to get under a microscope to do that. Um, and this one's going to require, require more of an area-wide treatment um, uh, protocol. So if you're just treating one house in a neighborhood that where these guys are, uh, it may not be enough. Uh, they may find their way in find their way back. Uh, if you did around the foundation, a lot of times these guys would actually pile up the dead ants that were killed from the treatment and then actually go right over it as a bridge and get inside the structure. So pretty prolific um, uh, pest. So I think I'm about uh, done on time. Um, the, uh, I'm gonna skip through some of these, get to the end of the ants. Uh, if there's any, anything anybody wanted to talk about, you know, we can definitely do that. Um, you know, in the Q&A, but I think I'm going to stop it here um, on brown marmorated stink bug, uh, one of the newer pests we see up in the Northeast and some other areas. But, um, so yeah, I think we're I think we're good for now. So uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing. I think just in the interest of time.